Today's tutorial is hopefully going to be simpler than the previous few ones. We've seen people create this using particle systems, but since we now have geometry nodes, I thought I'll remake the tutorial using geometry nodes and probably a completely different method. So let's begin learning how to create this particular loop. In our default scene, we're going to press X to delete the default cube, and then we'll press Shift A and search for a cylinder. Now, before you do anything, we'll expand the drop down over here and change the number of vertices all the way down to three so that we get a prism. Then you can change the depth as well to something like 12 and change the radius to maybe 1.5. Once you're happy with that, you can rotate this on the X axis by 90 degrees and then press enter and then hit 3 on your keypad to go into the side view. Once you're in the side view, you can scale this down on all the axes but the Y axis. So press shift Y and bring it down as close as possible to like one square. If you see the background grid, you see it's made up of bigger squares like this. So we have to make it as close as possible to one of those squares and we'll be pressing control so that it snaps to grid. So S shift Y and then just bring it down. I'll also grab it on the Z axis to bring it up. And I think I can just scale it down shift Y by one more unit. And this is the closest that we'll get to one unit. Once you have this, we can press tab to go into edit mode, or you can use the drop down over here and then press control R to enter loop cut mode. And then we have to bring our cursor to this edge so that we get a new edge loop like this. And then just use our scroll wheel on the mouse to increase the number of cuts till it exactly matches up with the grid behind, implying we have square faces. Uh, alternatively, you can just type in the number. And since we have the length as 12 units, we know that the number required or the number of cuts required is going to be 11. And then you can press enter twice. Once you have that set, you can press A to select everything and then press control E and click subdivide. And you can do that twice. So press control E again, subdivide. Alternatively, you could have expanded the drop down over here and changed the number of cuts to two, but doing it twice was fast enough. Now that you have this, you can press one to go into the front view and you see you have these faces at the front that we don't want. So we'll just switch on transparency by pressing this particular button and then we'll double tap A to deselect everything and also press three to enter face select mode or press this button up here. Once you've done that, press C for circle select and then just use your scroll wheel to increase the size and just select everything and also scroll it down and select these. And why we switched on transparency and we're doing this is such that we not only select the front face, we also select the back face. Once you have both of them selected, press X and delete faces. This is going to be the base mesh for our modifiers. So we can switch off transparency again and go to the modifiers tabs and start off with a simple deform modifier. Here, we're gonna change the twist angle axis to the Z axis because we haven't applied the rotation. But if you have applied the rotation by pressing Control A and applying all transforms, then you'd have to choose the Y axis. However, I'll only apply the scale because we'll need that for the geometry node later on. So I'll press Control A, apply scale. Then I'll change the twist angle to any multiple of 120, but I'll go with 360 itself for today. Then we'll have to add in a curve modifier Modifier. And for the curve modifier, we'll require a curve object. So we'll press Shift A and search for a circle curve. And then again, select our original cylinder. And for the curve object, select the Bezier circle. Now we have to change the deform axis to Y and it starts looping around itself. Now it's clearly going more than one loop. So we'll go and select Bezier circle and just scale it up until the two ends perfectly meet. So we can press Shift for smoother control and just make them touch each other like that. You can zoom in as well and then again scale and just make it as perfect as you can make it. Once you're happy with it, again, you could leave it like this, but I'm going to select the cylinder and scale it on everything but the Y axis to just make it a little fatter because I think that looks better. So I'll go with a scale of 1.5. And originally, this is why I had made the radius 1.5 at the beginning, but we had to scale it down again anyway. So that wasn't too helpful. However, now that we're at this stage, we can go ahead and add in the geometry node modifier by either adding it in as a modifier by pressing this button, or you can just click and drag from the junction of these two windows to create a new window, change the type to geometry node editor, and then press this new button. Remember, you need to make sure the cylinder is selected. Once you have that, you can just press shift A and search for an instance on points node and plug that in after the group input. And now you need some instance objects. So we'll press shift A and search for a UV sphere and then just plug that mesh into the instance. Now they're way too large. So we'll just play around with the radius till we get a size that we like. And now all of these spheres seem squished. So again, with the cylinder selected, I'll press control A and apply scale. 
and then they become round cylinders again. So we'll just play around with the radius till we get something that we like. So I think I'm going to go with the radius of 0.2 for this animation. Now that you have that set, we can go ahead and set shade smooth for each of these spheres because clearly you can see all of the faces when you zoom in. So I'll just bring the group output a bit further and press shift A and search for a set shade smooth node plug that in over there and then press shift A and search for a set material node and plug that in over there. Now for the material, we can go ahead and choose the default material. And with that, we are done with the modeling and the geometry node section. So now we can start off with the texturing. But before that, we'll go ahead and set all of our defaults. So we'll go to our render property, switch on ambient occlusion, bloom, screen space reflections. And under the ambient occlusion, I'll go ahead and increase the factor much higher. So I'll make it something like 10 and I'll increase the distance as well to one. To see the effects of that, I'll switch the viewport shading from solid to rendered and I'll also switch off overlays by pressing this button and this is where you'll be able to see the effects of the ambient occlusion. If the factors decrease to 1 you don't get as many shadows as if the factor is all the way up to 10 and the same thing goes with the distance. Since I want the shadows I'm increasing the ambient occlusion that much. After that we can change this window from the geometry node editor to the shader editor and then use the drop down menu to select the material that we added in to the geometry nodes. All I'm going to do is just reduce the roughness to 0.2 and I'll change the base color to a completely bright but very desaturated blue. So something like this. After that I want to deal with the actual background so I'm going to change from object to world and then I want the camera to see one particular color and the actual objects to use a different color. So I want the objects to use a single color. Maybe that color is going to be a very bright bluish color. So something like this. However, I want the camera to actually perceive a gradient. So to do that, I'm going to press shift A and search for a mix shader node and plug that in after the background. Then I'm going to press shift D and bring the background node down. Now for this background, I need to actually give it a gradient. So I'm going to press shift A and search for a gradient texture node. And to control the actual colors of the gradient, I'll have to press shift A and search for a color ramp node. Then plug the color into the factor and plug this output into the color of the background. And I can also press control shift click on the background node to actually see the gradient. Now clearly this is not the gradient that I want. I want it to be horizontal. So I'm going to press control T with the node wrangler switched on. Remember even control shift clicking requires the node wrangler. If you don't have that, go to your edit preferences, add-ons and just search for the node wrangler and check it. After that, we can change from generated to object and just rotate it on the Z axis by 90 degrees. And then you can change the black to a nice bluish color for the gradient. To actually see the perfect location of the gradient, we'll go ahead and add the camera. So we'll just take the camera, press Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation, and then grab it on the Z and just move it back up. And then we can also press zero to go into our camera view and then continue to move it on the Z axis till we zoom in to the perfect size. Then in our camera properties down here, we'll go to viewport display and change passport out all the way to one so that we can't see anything outside. After that, we'll just play around with the location of the mapping node on the X axis to get more of the white or less of the white based on your preference. So I think this type of a gradient is good enough. Once you've set up the perfect color ramp, you can go ahead and plug this into the bottom shader and then plug this into the actual surface output. However, we need to know how to mix these two together. So we'll press shift A and search for a light path node and then plug the is camera ray into the factor. That way, if it is a camera ray, it'll use the bottom socket. And if it's not, it'll use the top socket, which is exactly how we wanted it. And that's actually all there is to this texturing. Next, we have to do the animation. So for that, we'll set the animation defaults. We'll go to the output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second. The end frame is going to be 150 so that it's just a five second long loop. The output folder can be whatever you want it to be. File format is going to be FFmpeg video. And the encoding has to be set from Matroska to MPEG4 and an output quality of perceptually lossless. Then we can expand the timeline a little bit over here, go all the way back to frame zero and select the cylinder and then press I rotation and then go to frame 150 and just press R Y 360 and then press I rotation. Down here, we'll press T linear to change the interpolation from Bezier to linear so that it runs at the same speed throughout and it becomes a perfect loop. So this is the final animation that we actually get. And there's actually nothing else left to do except going up here and pressing render animation.
Hopefully you learned how to create this particular video and it wasn't anything too hard to follow. And I think this particular method is simpler than using particle systems and getting the number of vertices to perfectly match up and things like that. However, I'll let you be the judge of which method you'd like. If you enjoyed this particular video, trust me, there's a lot more videos on my channel that you'll definitely love. Do check them out and stay subscribed to never miss out on new videos that come out every single day. So until they do, keep creating and stay creative.